Emily Chang and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, the Apple X Factor. Cupertino hits reset on the smartphone game with its first handset design remix in years. We'll discuss the latest phones on tap and other products to be unveiled at the company launch event in just 24 hours. Plus, the fallout deepens after one of the biggest data breaches in U.S. history. We break down the ongoing disaster management effort at Equifax and the new rules being drawn up for better corporate transparency. And Amazon's grocer gains as part of its purchase of Whole Foods. It's added thousands of items to its website, causing a surge in online sales. But first, to our lead. The countdown to Apple's biggest event in years. As we have been reporting, the tech giant, now worth $800 billion, is expected to unveil three new iPhones on Tuesday, including a premium model called the iPhone X that carries a price tag of $1,000. The hoopla Apple has generated around the iPhone's 10th anniversary is a reminder of how the company and how much it relies on its iconic gadget, which still represents about 63% of sales. We will be at the big unveiling at the Steve Jobs Auditorium on Apple's new campus in Cupertino. This is the first time they will be opening it to the public. So will investors and customers buy in? Joining us to dig into it all are Bloomberg Tech Apple reporters Mark Gurman and Alex Webb. So you guys have been the drumbeat for us over the last weeks and months. Mark, I want to start with you when it comes to product. Any new details, anything that you haven't told us already that we will be seeing tomorrow? That I haven't told yes. you? Well, I think you can see it all, you know, at this point on Bloomberg's website, Alex and I have been doing. Oh, well, Alex has been doing a great job, and I've been helping, you know, on this, <laughs> on these uh, iPhones. You both have. You both yeah, have. Yeah, we've both been working hard on this. These iPhone stories. iPhone 10. there was this big code leak over the weekend. Basically, what happened was is a build of the final version of the iPhone, new iPhone's operating system, leaked on the web to a website called 9to5Mac, uh, which we know well. And it had lots of details about the phone in there. So the biggest revelation is the names: iPhone 8, iPhone 8 Plus, and iPhone 10. You know, you said iPhone X. Some people, it might be iPhone X, but I'm reading it as iPhone 10. I think it can go in either direction, and it's. I guess it's up to the user. So. And Alex, you've been crunching the numbers, trying to work out just how much more Apple will be making at this higher price point. What did you? I mean, I don't claim credit for crunching the numbers myself, but there's been some really great analyst reports on this, and Bernstein put out a report which said that a $1,000 iPhone could add about 6% to the uh, bottom line at Apple, which is clearly a big chunk of change. Uh, the obviously risk here is that uh, people aren't willing to pay that much for the phone. So what's really going to be interesting is seeing where the customer split lies. How many people think that it's worthwhile spending $1,000, that it's spaced out payments over two, maybe three years, some subsidies from, um, from carriers or whether they're just willing to pay for the 8 or the 8 Plus, which is still probably going to be a higher pr price point than the 7 and 7 Plus. So Apple's probably taking more money back home at the end of the day either way. Now, this is an interesting point that Bob O'Donnell of Technolysis raised on the show on Friday, which is that the iPhone 10 or the iPhone X or whatever it's called is going to be such a different design than the previous models or the iPhone 8. Could it cannibalize the sales of those smaller, those, you know, Lower end models. That's a good I question. Say lower, I'm, but I'm curious what Alex less thinks. expensive. What's the possibility that they lower the price of the eight and eight plus under the prices that the seven and seven plus came in in order to have a bigger differentiator, so they just don't lose sales of the? I mean, to me, it would seem unlikely because I think you have the advantage that if you've got an iPhone selling for a thousand dollars, all of a sudden it means that the one at the next price point down seems a lot cheaper, even though it might be more expensive than the predecessor. We're also probably going to see the widest range of pricing in iPhones that we've ever seen because, as far as we know, they're not going to kill the iPhone SE. It's currently selling for $399, I think, and there's always a chance they cut that price. So all of a sudden, we've got iPhones ranging from $300, $350 all the way up to $1,000. And when you talk about cannibalization and lower price points, perhaps having a detrimental effect on the higher price point, that's going to be a really interesting model. So what does that mean then for Apple globally? Obviously, we know about competition in China. You know, are we expecting in certain markets a pullback from Apple products because of the pricing or no, because they have now such a wide continuum. I think Apple's got a very effective uh, go-to-market and distribution network. And the odds are what they will try to do is push the lower price models, such as the iPhone SE, into India. Um, in particular markets in China, they'll place the higher range model, you know, the big um, conglo um, big cities there, conurbations, and then in the secondary markets, perhaps some of the lower price ones. I don't know if you've got a sense of what you think might be happening. Yeah, I mean, I think especially in the Chinese and some of the Asian markets, the iPhone 10 is going to be a hot seller. I actually saw an analyst report this morning saying that the gold version of the iPhone 10 is going to potentially launch later than the white and mm -hmm. black ones. And as we know, Apple came out with their first gold phone in 2013 to appeal directly to the Chinese market. So it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. What do we know 
about supply issues? I know we've been some concerned about supply constraints and what that means for the actual timeline when these phones will go on sale. Yeah, I mean, here, here's a warning. You're not going to find the iPhone 10. I know Alex has been, been wanting one. You might have to wait in line for a while oh, to, 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 <laughs> to my find one. For a pay rise, and I might go to get one. <laughs> yeah, but it, this is going to be hard to find. I think the 8 and 8 Plus are going to ship in high quantity yeah. throughout the course of the next month or so, starting in about a week and a half from tomorrow. They'll probably put it on pre-order in a couple days from now, Thursday at midnight. Now, it, Samsung is saying that pre-orders of the Note 8 have broken pre-sale records. That's a $930 phone. Is that good or bad news for Apple? It shows there's demand for those levels of those, um, those sort of prices. It'll be interesting also to see, given that appetite, last year we sort of said that the, app, the iPhone Q has died. You know, on launch day, we're used to seeing people queue around the block, or sorry, wait in line around the block, as <laughs> Americans might say. Um, and this perhaps demand for the iPhone X, iPhone 10, and the expectation that it'll, there'll be supply constraints, perhaps we'll see the, the, the the iPhone Q arriving again. We'll be seeing people around the block in Union Square here in San Francisco. All right, Q line, whatever you want to call it. Um, Mark, last question. There are other products that are going to be unveiled tomorrow. Apple TV, uh, talk to us at the watch. Tell us what else we can expect. So two other products, major product lines. Apple TV 4K. This version is going to be similar to the previous one, but it'll stream in high res 4K video. Apple Watch, you'll finally be able to make phone calls from it. You won't need to attach it to an iPhone at all times, LTE data. So three major products. It's going to be a very significant launch for Apple tomorrow. All right. Well, we'll see you both there tomorrow. Very excited. Mark Gurman and Alex Webb, who cover Apple for us. Thanks so much. Tune in tomorrow for our live coverage of the Apple product launch starting 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific, right here on Bloomberg Television and Bloomberg Radio. All right, Google took its fight over a record European Union antitrust fine to the EU courts, starting a legal challenge that could take years to conclude. The EU slapped Google with a $2.9 billion fine in July, saying the company unfairly uses its search engine to direct consumers to its own shopping platform. Intel waited eight years for a ruling on its 2009 antitrust challenge from the EU, only to be told last week the case must be re-examined. This is only the start for Google's EU troubles, as regulators are expected to levy fines next month in pros into probes into its AdSense advertising and Android mobile phone software. All right, coming up, Equifax still reeling from that massive data breach that may have impacted basically anyone in the U.S. with a credit card. Can their insurance policy come close to covering the damage? What are they doing to stop the bleeding? That is next. And Bloomberg Technology is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays, 5 p. in New York, 2 p. in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg. China is dropping the hammer on cryptocurrencies. The government has announced plans to ban trading of Bitcoin and other virtual currencies on domestic exchanges. The ban will only apply to trading of cryptocurrencies on exchanges, according to people familiar with the matter. It's the second blow to the nearly $150 billion global cryptocurrency market. Recently, China also outlawed initial coin offerings. Now to another story, we are following the massive Equifax data breach. Shares of the credit monitoring agency have dropped as much as 20% since news broke late last week. And a class action lawsuit filed in Oregon is demanding up to $70 billion in damages. While the company carries an insurance policy for situations like this, it reported only covering $100 million to $150 million in damages, reportedly. Joining me now to discuss the very latest, Phil Quaid, Chief Information Security Officer at Fortinet. Prior to that, he spent three decades in the NSA and served as the chief of the NSA Cyber Task Force. Phil, thanks so much for joining us. So first of all, the hackers got a six-week head start on investigators. What does that mean for the people whose data were, was stolen and for the investigators themselves? Well, uh, first of all, thanks for having me here today. I appreciate that. Uh, I think what it means is that the company is doing is due diligence to trying to figure out what happened, what the extent of the breach would be, and what they need to do to uh, address the uh, address the victims that that breach to include probably cooperating with local with uh, law enforcement to uh, to get to the bottom of it. That said, in Europe, there's there are laws against not reporting things like this faster. I, I believe you're required to report data breaches within 72 hours. I mean, wouldn't that make more sense so that the hackers don't get so much of a head start? 
Right. Uh, we, we might be talking a little bit about apples and oranges there. Uh, I think, of course, what you're, you're talking about is the European regulation called GDPR, which is uh, designed to bake in privacy protections for, uh, for uh, clients, for uh, companies that handle personally identifying information. The, uh, the approach in the Europe versus the United States is a little bit different. Where we here in the United States, we tend to, our economic and governance model is more one of um, market forces with perhaps the end of that continuum being uh, legislation. So more specifically, here in the U.S., we go from uh, market forces to public outcries to executive orders to regulation to legislation. And that's the continuum from sort of minimum to harsh. In the European Union, I think they start a little bit closer to the regulation part of that continuum, and there are indeed some hefty fines if you uh, have massive breaches of private information, up to 4% of uh, global revenue. Bloomberg spoke with Senator Dick Durbin, who said, we are duty-bound to step in on behalf of innocent citizens who are going to pay a price, adding this is an indictment of our current level of regulation when it comes to this industry and others. How do you respond to that? I think there is a role for, uh, for a government, be it the legislative or executive branch, and at a minimum, trying to incentivize companies to, uh, to uh, avoid the false choices. What I'm talking about are for false choices between uh, convenience, privacy, and security. You know, I want all three as a consumer, and the best uh, architectures and the best systems can indeed provide all three. So what do you imagine investigators are doing right now? Explain what's happening behind the scenes. Sure, they're looking for, uh, they're looking primarily at forensics. And uh, I, hopefully, uh, just as importantly, they're looking to the future. They're looking to see what types of strategies and techniques and technologies they ought to be implementing. Things like uh, really good segmentation, both at the macro level and micro level, so that future breaches scope are limited. They're also looking for, uh, looking for solutions that implement what I call uh, defense in depth. So rather than relying simply on point solutions, they might have a bunch of automated solutions working together over security fabric. And quite honestly, I, I'm guessing that they're looking very closely at what's the best way to communi communicate with the private sector since so many people were affected by this breach. So, you know, uh, there are reports that this was possibly accomplished by exploiting certain networks that other major companies are based on, what is the likelihood that many other companies could be at risk of the same kind of attack? It's quite possible. We don't have, uh, we collectively don't have that specific information yet about what the point, the point of the original breach was. There's one company who stepped forward who said that, uh, I think it might be us, and in fact, this is software that's used in 65 of the top 100 Fortune 100 companies. So, but what we don't know, though, is that whether it's a zero-day exploit of that particular software package or something that is, in fact, uh, there's a patch that's been released. So it's important for us to understand that, yes, there's a point of entry that they came, the, the perpetrators came in through, but there's likely other points in the network that where the network, uh, layer network defenses didn't quite live up to what was necessary. So, Phil, would you say that this, the scale of this breach is as bad as it gets, or it could be a lot worse? <laughs> the, the, the scale of this is about as bad as it gets. There's probably not a viewer of this, uh, of this good TV show that hasn't been affected. Uh, this, this is unique both in its uh, scale, number one, uh, number two, in the type of information that's breached. This isn't a matter of me simply having to change my email password or even email address. This, is result, this has resulted in a breach of hard to, hard to secure information, my social security number, my date of birth. And, uh, and, and that's, that's a very, these are very personal things. So it's different both in the, the scope of the compromise and the nature of it. And what do you imagine is actually going to happen to all of this information? Um, quite honestly, the, this is uh, most likely to be a criminal event. I, I like to categor categorize threats into four categories. Number one, uh, individual hackers who are looking to cause mischief, do trophy penetrations of companies or organizations. Number two, uh, persistent criminals who are looking to make a buck off of the compromise of commercial, uh, 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 private information. Three, it could be countries who are looking to destabilize democratic institutions. Or four, the fourth type of threat 
is uh, countries who look to impose their national will against other countries in times of crisis. This probably is something in the category two, where it looks like a criminal element. And so it's most likely that they're going to try and commoditize this, this private and financial information and sell it on the dark web or other places. All right. Uh, thanks so much, Phil, for your perspective. Fortinet Chief Information Security Officer Phil Quaid, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Coming up, Amazon's purchase of Whole Foods is rattling brick and mortar grocers, but also making an impact online. Details next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. You can listen on the Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. European Union regulators may try to ban employers from issuing workers wearable fitness trackers, even with the employee's permission. This is due to concerns surrounding how companies will use their employees' data. However, fitness tracking startups shouldn't sweat much yet. <laughs> the panel's recommendations are non-binding, leaving the final decision up to the individual EU nations. All right, well, immediately after Amazon's purchase of Whole Foods went through, the changes in the stores themselves started to happen. And while Amazon was shaking up brick and mortar locations, it also added thousands of Whole Foods items to its website. Our Bloomberg Tech reporter, Olivia Zaleski, joins us now uh, from New York with more on the story. So, Olivia, two things happened. They saw a 25% increase in foot traffic, and they also saw an increase in the amount of groceries sold online, you know, where analysts thought that they would actually have trouble doing that. Tell yeah, us what happened. Analysts were actually concerned that the two brands would cannibalize each other and that sales might go down in both places on Amazon.com and also in Whole Foods retail locations. It's actually quite the opposite. We saw that foot traffic went up about 25 percent. And we also saw that these 2,000 new SKUs that Amazon added from Whole Foods almost sold out entirely. Only 7 percent of the SKUs remain. So, you know, you and I have talked about how I prefer to do my grocery shopping in person. I want to see my, get my ripe avocados. <laughs> um, you know, at the same time, you know, some people are saying there could be a fundamental consumer shift in how people shop for groceries happening right now. You know, where will the chips fall? How much will happen in physical stores? How much will happen online? So several experts that I spoke with today said we're really on the precipice of a, a fundamental shift in consumer behavior, that consumers are really going to start feeling more comfortable now buying uh, groceries online. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that Amazon previously had a wide range of groceries, but there was no brand recognition with those groceries. There wasn't that sense of trust. You didn't really know where the produce was coming from. And one of the things that Whole Foods has done an incredible job of um, in all the years that it's been in business is building consumer trust. And it's, it's created an identity as a, as a healthy organic chain that really vets every product. So now Amazon, by buying Whole Foods, really just takes that trust under its umbrella and consumers are going to feel more comfortable. Actually, last year, um, less than 5% of people purchased uh, groceries online and already this year we're seeing that number rise to 13 percent. So how much of this traffic surge has to do about price? Does it all come down to how cheap you can get it? I think that's important. I think also what played a big role was all the press and, and marketing that happened in the last couple of weeks. Uh, there's a lot of excitement about this merger and I think that's really what we can learn from what's happened in the past couple of weeks is that this this merger between Amazon and Whole Foods in consumers eyes is a good thing. So what do we actually know about how well Amazon Prime Fresh, its online grocery service, is, is doing? So Amazon's very tight-lipped about that. Um, I'll have to get back to you with those numbers. I, I don't know how that is doing. Uh, talk to us about, you know, obviously there's a huge challenge happening here, dealing with fresh foods, dealing with uh, fresh groceries. How does Amazon plan to manage all of those challenges as it makes this massive transition? Well, one of the most remarkable things that analysts pointed out to me when I spoke with them today is how quickly uh, Amazon was able to get all these whole food SKUs online, how, how quickly it moved to put these 2,000 SKUs on its website. And I think that that's something that we should be really keeping a close eye on, is, is the way that Amazon can move quickly. Uh, it has an in incredibly um, 
fast back end. It's able to upload products much, much faster than most traditional grocery stores. Um, so one analyst I spoke with today said it would have taken about three months for a traditional brick and mortar store to get that many SKUs online. All right, Olivia Zaleski, thanks for keeping us updated on the numbers. Bloomberg is Olivia Zaleski in New York there. Coming up, anticipation for Apple's latest iPhone has hit fever pitch. We'll take a look at the iPhone and it's important to the company's evolving ecosystem of products next. And a feature I want to bring to your attention, our interactive TV function. You can find it at Bloomberg TV Go. You can watch us live. If you miss an interview, you can go back to us. It, you can send our producers a message, play along with the charts we bring you on air. This is for Bloomberg subscribers only. Check it out at TV Go. This is Bloomberg. I'm Mark Crumpton in New York. You're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's begin with a check of first word news. President Trump says 9-11 was a wake-up call to the country. The president spoke at a memorial service at the Pentagon on this, the 16th anniversary of the terrorist attacks. Not only did the world change, but we all changed. Our eyes were opened to the depths of the evil we face. The United Nations Security Council votes today on a scaled-down sanctions resolution against North Korea. It eliminates initial U.S. demands to ban oil imports to the country and frees international assets of Kim Jong-un and his allies. The version on the table is strong, it is robust, uh, it is a very significant set of additional sanctions on uh, imports into North Korea and on exports out of North Korea and uh, other measures as well. Irma's been downgraded to a tropical storm, but it still caused significant damage. After triggering record flooding in Florida, it crossed into Georgia, where it produced storm surges along the coast with South Carolina. A tropical storm warning was issued for the first time ever in Atlanta. In Florida, more than 6 million people were without power. In Mexico, authorities say the massive earthquake last week that devastated the southern part of the country killed at least 90 people. Aftershocks are still being felt across the region. The quake also destroyed or damaged thousands of homes and hundreds of schools. Global News 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. It's just after 5.30 p.m. here in New York, 7.30 Tuesday morning in Sydney. My colleague Paul Allen has a look at the markets. Paul, good morning. Good morning, Mark. Well, we are expecting a pretty decent day in the Asia-Pacific after that relief rally in the United States. Uh, Florida appearing to dodge the worst of Hurricane Irma, so we've got insurance stocks and oil higher. And we're seeing that play out on futures for the Nikkei, up by about half of 1%, traded out of Chicago, and ASX futures here in Australia, up about half a percent as well. We've been talking about the Aussie dollar versus the US dollar recently. Now seems to have some sustained strength above 80 cents US, and we'll be keenly watching the pricing of the iPhone in Australian dollars, which does highlight the overvalued local unit. Uh, Commonwealth Bank runs an iPhone index, which shows that that phone is becoming less affordable uh, despite the high Aussie dollar. Elsewhere, we're waiting on business confidence here in Australia. Philippines exports for July and Singapore retail sales also for July. I'm Paul Allen in Sydney. More from Bloomberg Technology next. Technology, I'm Emily Chang. Now back to our lead story. Apple's next phone offering will almost certainly transform the way people use the high-end device. Though Apple's ability to change the way we interact with the technology isn't new, ahead of Apple's big product launch, I took a look back at the most crucial product for the company, the iPhone. 
Apple has set a date for its most significant new product announcement in years. On September 12th, the tech giant plans to introduce three new iPhones with a variety of features, including facial recognition and gesture controls, a move that will most certainly transform the way people use it. Apple's ability to change the way we interact with technology isn't new. Ever since customers got their hands on the very first iPhone on June 29, 2007, the market has been revolutionized. The smartphone has proven to be the undisputed king of Apple products and in turn revolutionized an entire ecosystem, destroying heavyweights of the day and spurring on new rivals across the globe like Oppo and Xiaomi. The iPhone also opened the doors to what has become a large chunk of the company's revenue, apps. App sales have generated roughly $100 billion in gross revenue for Apple, with more than 16 million developers worldwide producing apps ranging from Uber to Snapchat. The launch of the iPhone didn't just change the way people work and socialize, it also transformed the company itself. Apple grew by every dimension, going from a company with staff of around 18,000 pre-iPhone to a workforce of 116,000 in 2016. And Apple's sales went from $19 billion in 2006 to over $215 billion in 2016. It doesn't stop there. Since its launch, Apple has sold about 1.3 billion iPhones, generating more than $800 billion in revenue. That blows other iconic devices out of the water, including Nintendo's Game Boy, which sold 118 million units over its lifetime, and the Sony Walkman, which sold over 200 million in 38 years. But with the iPhone's astronomical growth rate comes heavy dependence. The iPhone makes up a whopping 63% of Apple's revenue, making it the company's most crucial product by far. Some tech heavyweights are sounding the alarm on the future of smartphones, with longtime Silicon Valley investor Peter Thiel saying of the device, it's not an area where there will be any more innovation. It's clear that Apple CEO Tim Cook sees things differently. I think we're just getting started. And uh, so I'm, I'm incredibly excited, and, and clearly there's nothing that uh, I think virtually anybody would say uh, is going to replace a smartphone anytime soon. As Apple looks toward the next decade and the competition continues to ramp up, a major question remains. How long can the iPhone remain at Apple's core? Now, Apple's product launch isn't the only major event happening in the Silicon Valley area. Mobile World Congress Americas also kicks off this week. The event touts itself as one of the premier mobile industry events for the region and will have some of the mobile industry's most influential executives to share their visions of the mobile industry and future trends. Joining us now to discuss, Cellular Telecom Industry Association President and CEO Meredith Atwell-Baker. CTIA is in partnership with the event. Meredith, thank you so much for joining us. Thrilled to be here. So what are the trends of the future? <laughs> well, we're going to be talking a lot about the connected life and the next generation of networks called 5G. And this is, is as Tim Cook was just saying, this is going to transform the way we work, the way we live, and the way we play for the next generation even more than we have in the last 10. So it's 100 times faster than speeds we have now, right? What does that mean? What's possible? Uh, there's no lag time. And so if a car is going 60 miles an hour down the highway in a 4G network, it would stop in 4.6 feet. Under a 5G scenario, that same 60 mile an hour car would stop in an inch. So it really does let you do autonomous cars and m remote surgeries, all kinds of things with these new networks. We are expecting three new iPhones to be unveiled tomorrow. The Samsung Note 8 is you know, breaking pre-sale records. What does that mean for the industry? Uh, it's so exciting how all of this innovation is happening here in the United States and what the app companies that are all here in San Francisco, how they actually are changing our lives and the things that they are going to be able to do and bring us in this next generation of 5G networks is really incredible. When it comes to 5G, are any of the service providers ahead of one another? I mean, I know they're all trying to mark their territory, but is anyone you know, farther ahead than the rest? This is a global race to 5G. We won the race in 4G, and that's why all the innovation happens here in the United States. We've got 30 trials here in the United States, but China's got 100 trials going on this year. Uh, Japan and Korea are really racing to get it done for their Olympic commitments. Uh, we know that leaders of the various wireless companies met with uh, the Trump administration earlier this year. What can the government do to compel the shift to 5G? These new networks are more about um, 
antennas that are the size of a shoebox or a pizza box as opposed to a 200 foot tower. So we need new rules for these new networks. We're going to have to put 300 new site, 300,000 new sites up over the next few years. That's twice as many as we've done in the entire industry existing. So what does the U.S. have to do to be more competitive? Um, we need to change our infrastructure rules so that we can roll these sites out faster at more affordable cost. And um, we need more spectrum. We're always going to need more new spectrum as America's dying to have more and more mobile devices. We're going to need more spectrum. Um, you're a former FCC commissioner, and I'm curious what you think of the current commission's efforts to roll back net neutrality. Hey, we have got five super smart commissioners in place. I think we just all agree more than we disagree, and I think that really? it's, it's time for Congress to act and just stop the ping pong back and forth. So I mean, what's the result you would like to see? We all believe in a free internet that innovators need to be able to innovate on, and I think we just need to get the rules right so that we can have proper investment so we can build these 5G networks. But in this case, the fine print really does matter. I mean, getting the rules right has caused massive disagreement, and you've got strong feelings on both sides. I, I think it's more hype than it is actual because, honestly, we all believe that we want the next innovations to occur, but we also believe that we want to have remote surgeries and we want to have autonomous cars. So we just want to make sure that we don't close the door to innovation as we're still in the beginning stages of these networks. So what do you think the actual impact will be if net neutrality rules are rolled back? I don't think we'll see any change. Really? Why <laughs> I, not? I think that the, the companies are all committed to have free and open internet and I think that that commitment is real and so I think that we'll have the same innovation that we had before the net neutrality rules as we'll having afterwards. So same impact for consumers as well? We same won't impact. see a difference? Same impact. Interesting. All right. Meredith Atwell Baker of the CTIA, thank you so much thank for you. joining us. Great to have you. Well, GoPro shares rose as much as 11% in Monday trading to the highest level since February. The pop in stock coming after Oppenheimer analyst expressed optimism in the camera maker's turnaround strategy, which includes cost cuts and an updated product line. Recently, GoPro said that third quarter revenue and margins would be at the high end of the company's forecast. Coming up, back in May, the WannaCry ransomware attack crippled hundreds of thousands of computers across the world. Is it still a threat? We'll speak to the man whose company discovered its kill switch next. This is Bloomberg. The Equifax data breach is just the latest in a series of cyber attacks. In fact, it ranks as the fifth largest hack on record, having affected some 143 million people. But in May this year, it was the WannaCry ransomware attack that held the world in its grip. Hackers infected over 230,000 computers in over 150 countries, demanding a ransom in Bitcoin or users' data would be lost. Joining me now, Salim Nino, the CEO of Cryptos Logic, the company credited with discovering the kill switch against the WannaCry ransomware. So first of all, Salim, is WannaCry still a threat as of this moment? Well, the actual threat has been brought to a standstill and nullified. Uh, we've been the custodian of the uh, so-called kill switch for a number of months now. And that kill switch is actually what has been preventing any further uh, propagation of the actual attack. So it still is an actual threat, uh, but CryptosLogic has maintained the kill switch such that the attacks have been nullified. So. Uh when it comes to attacks like Equifax, first of all, you know, what do you make of this attack and how it compares to something like WannaCry? I think it's interesting is that we don't really have any kind of scale to measure cyber attacks today. Uh, I, I spoke to this uh, in a congressional hearing earlier this year that we, we need some sort of Richter scale to be able to determine what cyber attacks actually look like uh, from the point of view from businesses and individuals. And when we look at Equifax, we see that that was a huge and very high magnitude event because none of that data can ever come back. It's, it's irrecoverable. Uh, where if you look at like an attack like WannaCry, 
you may lose your business, you may have business interruption, you may lose some of those systems, but eventually you, you could continue. So I think Equifax and the WannaCry attack were both substantially high magnitude attacks uh, that, were, that were crippling. So would that be 8.0 on the Richter scale or higher? I think WannaCry was in a 7 to 8 because it was thwarted, but I think that uh, Equifax is somewhere in the 9.9 .9 with a 2.0 response. Wow. <laughs> All right. So on that note, what kind of cybercrime will follow this Equifax attack? I mean, I mean, we can assume these crimes are happening now. What is happening now? We, we have to be really careful. Actually, you can always look back to previous breaches and kind of use that as a threat model to see what could happen. If you, look, if you recall back to Ashley Madison breach, um, we saw that uh, there was a lot of things that happened and one of those things were the follow-up of fraudulent emails or extortion to get information out of people who were worried about uh, their dating preference or their infidelity or lack thereof. So when we look at uh, Equifax, you're going to see a lot of interesting things and you're going to see potential phishing emails, you're going to see fake websites asking you to validate your social security number and determine, hey, uh, we will tell you if you've been breached or not and in actuality you're, you're actually breaching yourself. So you want to be really careful about the next few days and weeks and carefully assess phone calls you get, emails you get, and websites you visit in terms of validation, validating any particular threat. Another thing that you're going to want to definitely think about as you're looking at this is all of your inventory of very sensitive emails, bank logins, or anything that's financial like forex trading accounts, things like that, and really think about how do you actually reset your password there? What is the type of questions you use? And, and look at that in retrospect and think about do I use uh, my birth date to reset my email or any of the questions that, were, that could potentially be in this breach? Uh, and in terms of financial, uh, do I use my social security number and does the company that I call use their social security number to authenticate me? So I think that both the individual and the businesses that are currently dealing with this right now need to think about in introducing authentication measures uh, as a measure of response to this particular uh, breach of data that we've had. Now, we had a guest on earlier who said he believes that this attack is as bad as it gets, as bad as it can get. Uh, but you think about companies like Facebook and Google, which also have huge troves of user data. You know, could companies like that be hacked to a much more detrimental effect? I think that's a really good question and you have, to, you have to look at it in terms of how you quantify the data. Many advertisers have access to a lot of the websites that we voluntarily share information with. Whereas Equifax was more of a, it, it, some of that information aggregated may not have been voluntary. In addition to that not being voluntary, it is the most sensitive information that's irrecoverable. Right? It's not so easy to change my driver's license number, social security, or birth, and I definitely can't change my birth date. So if I were right. to lose my Facebook Messenger post, okay, fine. And you also have to look at another thing when it comes to risks and threat modeling. From a cybersecurity perspective, what we look at CryptoSog, the way we look at something like Facebook, is that's a vast amount of data, and handling that data is extremely uh, large, and even Facebook has its own challenges in handling that data. But when you look at the Equifax breach, that database of 150 million rows of user data may actually right. not be that big. It could probably fit on a USB drive. Okay, we'll have to leave it there. Uh, fascinating stuff. Uh, Salim Nino, CEO of Cryptos Logic, thanks so much for sharing your perspective. We're obviously continuing to follow the Equifax breach. Coming up, we take a special look at the future of the electric car industry, the factors that could make or break the adoption of the tech worldwide. Next, this is Bloomberg. All this week, Bloomberg is taking a special look at the future of the electric car industry. Bloomberg will discuss the range of factors that could make or break the global adoption of the technology. Today, we saw multiple headlines in the industry, first with Tesla, the Elon Musk-led company, paving the way for the arrival of its Model 3 by targeting city centers with the expansion of its supercharger network. The first of Tesla's new urban stations opened for charging in a 10-stall location in Chicago and an 8-stall site in Boston. Drivers will have to wait 45 to 50 minutes to replenish their battery. 
Meantime, in China, the government is working with regulators to set a deadline to end fossil fuel car sales in the country. It would make China the largest market to target a ban on gasoline and diesel vehicles. Our Bloomberg correspondent Tom McKenzie has all the details from Beijing. This is a significant, if not entirely unsurprising, development in the world's largest car market. Private automakers like Warren Buffett-backed BYD and state-owned firms like Bayak have poured billions of dollars into electric vehicle development in the last few years. And sales have been bolstered by government subsidies. The decision to phase out fossil fuel vehicles is expected to accelerate those trends. Beijing wants to cut the country's reliance on imported oil, reduce pollution and crucially play a leading role in the electric vehicle space. Britain and France have already said they'll phase out diesel and gasoline fueled vehicles by 2040. Foreign automakers are doubling down in their attempts to carve out market share in China's growing EV sector. Nissan and Honda both plan to release EV models in 2018-2019, while Tesla is looking to set up a factory in Shanghai. Tom McKenzie, Bloomberg, Beijing. Finally, one of the automakers looking to go electric is Volkswagen. The company today unveiled plans to build electric versions of all 300 models in the group's lineup. Speaking on the eve of the Frankfurt Auto Show, Volkswagen CEO Matthias Mueller vowed to spend $24 billion to develop and bring the models to market by 2030 and promising to plow billions of dollars into the batteries needed to power cars. Bloomberg's Matt Miller caught up with Mueller and spoke about the finances of the announcement. Volkswagen is very robust, financially speaking. So you don't really have to worry. We'll have the necessary we're with us to implement our plans. Of course, uh, we're making an investments every year. We're investing parts of our profits. We did that in the past. We'll do it in the future. And we're going to make the money that we need for those investments. Do you still feel the need to sell off certain units? It, there was talk about the possibility of a sale of Ducati, some uh, heavy truck parts units, maybe an IPO. Um, is, that, is that all still necessary to this plan? Well, I've been reading about this in the newspaper. Sometimes I don't really understand this ongoing discussion. One of my most important tasks is to think about our product portfolio on an ongoing basis and to ask myself whether we are properly positioned for the future. This is what we do. We are relaxed about this. And uh, if and when decisions need to be taken in terms of a sale or an acquisition of companies, then we'll talk about it openly. You did say in the press release today that you plan on an electrified version of each of the 300 or so models in your uh, portfolio. Does that mean we'll see an electric Ducati Monster or even a superbike? Well, you have to ask Ducati, really. But to answer your question, Volkswagen has learned from the past. And over the past two years, we've understood what people understand by sustainable mobility. And this Roadmap E that we've announced and uh, which you alluded to is a self-commitment. And it's going to be our yardstick going forward. All right, Volkswagen CEO Matthias Mueller there with Bloomberg's Matt Miller. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Remember, Bloomberg TV and radio will air a special covering the Apple product launch this Tuesday in less than 24 hours. Coverage starts 1 p.m. Eastern Time. And a reminder, we are live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. That's all for now. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.